going to have. Before we open the Bible today to be able to study uh, what we need for now, for this time, let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. O oh, Almighty and Everlasting Father, we are so thankful that indeed Thy love is like a river and an ocean to us. We thank Thee for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who died for our sins and whoever lives to make intercession for us. We thank Thee, O oh God, now for this time that we can look at Thy Word and be able to study its precepts and its promises, to be able to know how we ought to live in this time in earth's history to be able to know what we ought to learn from the things that have happened in the past and the principles and the guidelines that are given in thy holy word. I pray, dear God, for the forgiveness of my sins and the cleansing of my unrighteousness so that I can speak with thine anointing and I can speak with thy power and so that, Lord, uh, we can be given the peace and direction that we need as to how to live in these last days. Help us, O Father, be with us today and give us thy grace and thy strength. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of the message today is how to look at and handle the coronavirus biblically. And indeed, we have to look at things biblically before we panic. In the Bible, the virus is called a plague. And the meaning of the word plague in the Greek is a public calamity. And that's exactly what's happening as you look around the world today. Heavy affliction. That's another word for plague. And a wound. That's another word for plague. So how do we look at this biblically? What does the Bible have to say about this? And how do we live through these plagues? How are we able to live and how ought we to live? The first thing we ought to realize is that we ought to live with the realization that we live in a sinful world, which is under a curse and a blessing. Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 to 19. Genesis chapter 3 verses 16 through 19. And in Genesis 3, verse 16, we have the result of what would happen, of what had happened as a result of Adam and Eve taking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and eating from it and disobeying God and allowing sin to enter into their lives. The Bible says in Genesis 3, 16, Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Shalt thou return. And so here, Adam and Eve were reminded that everywhere they would look in the basic elements of life, whether it be by birth, whether it be by work, or whether it be by travail, everything would have sorrow mixed into it. Everything would have thorns and thistles mixed into it. Everything would have difficulties mixed into it. It would be a hard life. It would be a difficult life because sin has been allowed into this planet, into our lives, into our beings. And as a result of sin and rebellion, we've ha we have allowed Satan to enter and become the God of this world. And the God of this world functions this way. He is out to kill and to destroy mankind. He is out to make us sick. He is out to make us, uh, to, to, to get us to go away from God. He is out to, uh, to, to stimulate and to multiply sin in this world. But praise God that it didn't end with a curse. Because God made a promise in Genesis 3.15, and the promise is powerful. He said to Eve, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Jesus' heel would be bruised, meaning that he would die temporarily for the sins of the world, but then he would be resurrected on the third day to ever live and, and reign and be our Savior and our Lord. But he would bruise the devil's head, meaning he would kill and exterminate the powers of darkness eventually. On the cross, he made a spectacle, an open spectacle of sin and Satan and the devil, and he exposed them, and the day is coming when he will make an end of all sin and all unrighteousness. But we have to understand that in the meantime, 
We live in a sinful world. And sin has consequences. And part of that consequence, uh, part of those consequences are the judgments of God when we sin and when we allow sin to reign in our lives. Sometimes plagues are direct judgments from God to lead His people to repentance and faith and to lead the people of the world who are lost to repentance and salvation. First of all, sometimes plagues are direct judgments from God to lead His people to repentance. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and beginning in verse 15. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and beginning in verse 15. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and beginning in verse 15, we notice what God says there. First, He had pronounced blessings upon His people. You will be blessed if you listen to me, if you follow my word, if you draw close to me, if you are obedient to my voice, you will be blessed. In verse 1 he says, And it shall come to pass of Deuteronomy 28, If thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all His commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon thee. Blessings in their food, blessings in their family, blessings in all these things. It's not necessarily the amount that you have, but it's necessarily that you enjoy whatever you have and you are at peace and contentment because God is in the midst when you follow His word and His voice. But notice now what he says in verse 15, But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store. And notice what it says here, is a very interesting verse here in verse 21. It says, The Lord shall make the pestilence to cleave unto thee, until he have consumed thee from off the land, whither thou goest to possess it. The pestilence to cleave upon thee. That word pestilence means a disease or a plague. He will make it stick to you. In other words, that disease will cleave to you because you have not cleaved to the Lord. Because when you cleave to the Lord, he will allow these things not to come upon us as his people. But because we do not cleave to God, the disease, the pestilence will cleave to us. And then it says in verse 22, The Lord shall smite thee with a consumption, and with a fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with the sword, and with blasting, and with mildew, and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. Now this verse is fascinating. Because this verse is describing exactly what's happening in the world right now. I want to show that to you. First of all, a consumption in the Hebrew here, the word consumption in verse 22, is a disease of the lungs. And you notice, what does corona attack? The lungs. What else does it say? It says also that you will have a fever. And that word for fever there means a burning up. A burning, an extreme burning. With inflammation, with an extreme burning. So this is describing a disease very similar to this. Extreme heat, violent heat, fever. And what happens next? It says, with the sword. Battle will come, or that word can also mean drought, with blasting and with mildew. That has to do with the food running out. That's exactly what's happening. Do you see what's going on here? This is a judgment from God. Now, you can spin this any way you want. You can say, well, this is a man-made disease. You can say, well, this disease just happened by accident. Whatever happened, God allowed it to happen. This is a judgment of God. And I know that's not a popular sentiment. And I know people don't like to hear that kind of thing. But that's what the Bible says. And we've got to stick with the Bible. This is a judgment that either God has caused directly. Or He has allowed to happen. To show His people that they need to make their lives right with God. And as I was saying earlier during the Sabbath school class. We have been given a glorious opportunity here to get right with God. We have been shut in with God. We have been shut in with God in our homes and in our lives so that we can make our lives right with God. This is a golden opportunity for us to make our lives right with God. And so, sometimes this comes as a judgment. Why does it come as a judgment to God's people? Notice, first of all, verse 15. 
if you will not hearken, listen to the voice of the Lord thy God, to do what? To observe, to do all His commandments and His statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. I will not stop them because you have not listened, you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord God. Now notice what it says in verse 20. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke, and all that thou settest thine hand to, unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. The wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken We have forsaken God. The world has said to God today, we don't need thee. We don't need the Bible. We don't need the commandments. We don't need thy laws. We don't need thy statutes. We don't need thy principles. And God has said, you've forsaken me. I'm now forsaking you. Why? Because he doesn't love us? Because he wants to kill us? No, because he loves us. And he wants to tell us the reality of what's happening so that we can repent and turn to God. When the Israelites heard these curses, they were to keep these things in mind so that they could never leave God. That's what God is doing for us today. And notice what it says in verse 45. Moreover, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee, and shall overtake thee, till thou be destroyed, because thou hearkenest not unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to keep His commandments and His statutes, which He commanded thee. It's as simple as that. God is telling His people today, you need to return to me. And all biblical preaching since the beginning of time, when, when things have happened in the land, when pestilences have happened, when plagues have hit the land, when, when, when drought has hit the land, all biblical preaching has included this message. This is a call to repentance. This is a call to return to God. This is a call to make your life right with God. And for some of us, it may be the last. So what are we going to do? So that's one element. But also, these plagues are for the world. The world to see that we have come to a place now where we can't depend on anyone or anything but God. For the world to learn now that you can't depend on your money anymore. You can't depend on what you have anymore, your material goods. You can't even depend on the health you think you have or the age that you are, or the immune system that you have. You can't depend on anything but God in this case. It's an interesting uh, study in reactions to plagues when we study the life of Pharaoh. In Exodus chapter 7 and verse 23, we remember the plagues that hit Egypt so that God's people can be taken out of Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 7, verse 23, you know, they started with, the, with, with the, the plague of the water changed to blood in the Nile because the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. The Egyptians worshipped the river and they, they ascribed powers to that river, a creative powers to that river that only belonged to God. God put the Nile there. His power makes things creative. But the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. And so now the Lord turned the water into blood. And just because the magicians could put a little color in water and make it look red, that's not the same thing. God turned the whole river into blood. That's not the same thing at all. But because Pharaoh saw something similar, he used it as an excuse to continue sinning. And that's what happens so many times, not only to the war people of the world, but even to the people in the church. We use these opportunities to justify sin. We say, well, if this goes away and I make it, I'll go right back to business as usual. Big mistake. Now notice what it says about Pharaoh here. <laughs> this is amazing. Verse 23. Pharaoh turned and went into his house. Neither did he set his heart to this also. So when the waters were smitten and they turned to blood, Pharaoh didn't set his heart on this. Well, what did he do? He said, well, the magicians can do it too. So why do I need to worry about it? But what he wasn't realizing was, so what if the magicians can do it? You're running out of water. So what if the magicians can do the same thing? Yeah, we've poisoned this earth for plenty already. So what? Who can turn it back again? Can the, magi can the magicians make the water back into water again? No, only a creative power can do that. Only God can do that. 
But if we don't set our hearts to what's happening right now, beloved, if we don't put our hearts in this thing and say, God is speaking to us, He's calling us to live a life that is pleasing to Him, then it's just going to continue. Because another plague fell, right? Another plague fell with the frogs. And what happened? Verse 6 of chapter 8. Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt. Frogs came up, covered the land of Egypt. And what happened? In verse 7. The magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. <laughs> and what did Pharaoh do? Then Pharaoh called from Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. So just take the frogs away, because the, magician the magicians can bring the frogs in, but they can't take them out. Only God can do that. So entreat them to take them out. And that's usually what we do, isn't it? We say, oh Lord, just help me this once, and I will do everything foxhole prayers, we call them. Right? When we're at a state of emergency, oh, I'll give myself, I'll surrender myself, I'll do anything, Lord. Just let this calamity pass. And the Lord, out of His mercy, allows the calamity to pass to show you that you weren't really serious. <laughs> that you weren't really serious with what you were saying because you go right back to the drawing board. Pharaoh here said, pray. And then what did Moses say? Moses said to Pharaoh, glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee and for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and the houses that they may remain in the river only? And he said, tomorrow. And he said, be it according to thy word that thou mayest know that there's none like unto the Lord our God. I'm going to pray to God to take this plague away so that you can know what? That there's nobody like God. See? So it happened. And notice verse 15. Moses prayed the next day. The frogs were gone. Verse 15 says, When Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. That's what I was saying earlier. You pray the prayer, there's a respite, and you go right back to your old life. Spirit of Prophecy says something very interesting here in 4th Spiritual Gifts 54 and 55. During the plagues on Egypt, Pharaoh was punctual in his superstitious devotion to the river and visited it every morning. And as he stood upon its banks, that is the Nile, he offered praise and thanksgiving to the water, recounting the great good it accomplished and telling the water of its great power that without it they could not exist, for their lands were watered by it and supplied meat for their tables. So he still went to the Nile and ascribed power to the Nile. And today we want to ascribe power to whoever can fix this mess, humanly speaking. We want to ascribe power to them and say, oh, they'll make a vaccine for this. They're going to develop a cure for this. Something is going to happen to cure this. That's a very Pharaoh-like re reaction to the problem. Pharaoh didn't stop his devotions to his pagan gods because he had hardened his heart. Let us be careful lest the same thing happen to us. In Exodus 8, verse 28, notice what it says there. Pharaoh said, I will let you go, that ye may sacrifice to the Lord your God in the wilderness, only ye shall not go very far away. Entreat for me, because now the flies had come in. So pray for me, I'll do it, but not too far. Compromise, see? Uh, Lord, just help me with this problem, and I'll do so much for you, and not more. No, God says, I want all of you. My son, my daughter, give me thine heart. Don't just give me part of you. Give me everything. That's what he wants. Because when you give him everything, then he gives you his grace, his peace, his love, his salvation, his faith, his joy. And notice, the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and he removed the swarms of flies. Verse 31, from Pharaoh, from his servants, from his people. And what happened? Verse 32, Pharaoh hardened his heart also, at this time also, neither would he let the people go. So he says, I'll let you go a little bit. Once the flies left, I won't let you go at all. Hardening of the heart. Be very careful that you don't find yourself in this position, beloved. Because we're in the midst of a plague. We're in the midst of plagues right now. How are we going to handle these plagues? We need to really make sure that we make our lives right with God and we mean it. We don't just do it because it's an emergency situation, because we want respite. We do it because we really realize how powerful God is and how important He is and how much He loves us and how much He wants us to, to live uh, in our lives. Now notice, next came 
the, uh, the plague, the fifth plague was the disease on the cattle, right? And notice what happened here in verse 3 and 4. Behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, upon the horses, the asses, the camels, upon the oxen, the sheep. There shall be very grievous murrain. That's a disease that hits cattle. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel. Hmm. So the Lord wanted to put a difference between Israel and between Egypt by protecting them. Oh God, how we need His protection today. How we need to live for Him so that His protective mercies can be upon us and people can see that there's a difference between Egypt and Israel. And in chapter 9, verse 7, it says, And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened that he did not let the people go. So instead of now, now God wanted to show, look, there's a difference between my people and your people. And even this caused him to hard his heart, harden his heart. And that's what will happen in the world. That's why in the end times, they're going to blame all the calamities on us. You see, it's the same thing. Kept hardening his heart, kept hardening his heart over and over and over again. And in the end, he was killed crossing the Red Sea. So, or his army was killed crossing the Red Sea, but he lost. He lost the battle. So we have to be so careful, beloved, that we don't lose the battle. In this time of plague, we should be getting our hearts right with God. We should have faith in God. We should go forward. We should say, Lord, thy judgments are just. We deserve them. We deserve them. Not to go along with what the world is saying. Oh, how can you say such a thing? How can God judge this? And how can God affect that? No, we richly deserve the judgments that have come upon us, O oh Lord. Lead us to repentance. And for the world, it's saying, come to Christ. Come to Christ. He's the only hope of mankind. He's always been the only hope of mankind. And so interesting to see here Pharaoh's reaction. In chapter, um, chapter 9, again, the boils came in, the sixth plague. And notice what happens. The magicians, verse 11, could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians. And all the land on all the Egyptians, and the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. So God knew what was going to happen, but he didn't hearken to them because even though he saw that the boil here, even the magicians were not able to handle, even the doctors were not able to handle the plague. He saw it, but he still hardened his heart. And beloved, we can't do that. And then he started to barter and negotiate. Look at this in chapter 10 during the uh, locust plague. The locusts came, chapter 10, and then verse 17, verse 16. It says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now therefore forgive, I pray thee, my sin only this once. Does that sound familiar? And entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. Just this once. I'm not going to do it again. Just this once. But how could, how could Pharaoh have a change of heart, a conversion experience, if he still went and worshipped the Nile every day? If he still stuck and clung to his beliefs and his traditions? If he did not come to God so that he could be saved? So the Lord turned the mighty west wind. He entreated the Lord, and then the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go. In verse 20, again and again, you see this happening, beloved. And the lesson is there from us. At the end, notice what happens. Chapter 10, verse 28. The Pharaoh said unto him, Get thee from me, take heed to thyself, see my face no more, for in the, the de that day that thou seest my face, thou shalt die. So one more time, if I see you, Moses, I'm going to kill you. He got to that point. Now it says God hardened his heart. But you know, God doesn't harden your heart by force. God leaves you to yourself to do what you're going to do, and your heart becomes hardened. It's like when the sun hits the wax, and it melts. And some other things the sun hits, and they harden, like mud and clay. 
So when that heat hits a heart that is receptive to him, the heart softens. When that heat hits the, the heart that is not receptive to him, it hardens. And that's exactly what happened to Pharaoh. And in the end, he was even going to kill God's messenger because he didn't want to hear about the truth, even though he had seen signs and wonders, beloved. Signs and wonders and miracles and all these great things. We can ask God for miracles today, but we have to have a heart to appreciate those miracles, to receive those miracles, and to give our lives to Christ. And so plagues are direct judgments from God sometimes to lead His people to repentance and faith and to lead the lost to repentance and salvation. Also, other times, thirdly, plagues are requested by Satan and allowed and permitted by God to demonstrate the character of His people and allow them to grow more mature in righteousness. Do you remember what happened to Job? We all know the story of Job. Job was a man who feared God and eschewed evil. Job was a man who was uh, very wealthy and busy. But every day he prayed for his children. Every day he brought his children to the altar to pray that God would forgive them of their sins. And one day, Satan came to God and challenged him to release Job into his evil care. And what ended up happening? God said, you can have him, but spare his life. And what happened? Because God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? That there's not a man like him on the earth. And Satan said, prove it. Let me have him for a while and I'll show you that he's not what you think he is and I'll prove you wrong. And the great controversy here hung in the balance for Job's reaction. But Job, because he learned to worship God during peaceful times, because he had learned to worship God during good times, during times of relative peace, how did he react when he lost his cattle, his stock, and especially his dear children? How did he react? Did he say, why have you done this to me? Did he say, oh, how could you do this to me? Did he do all that? No. In verse 20, it says, Job arose of Job 1 and ripped his mantle, shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and did what? Worshipped. Why? Because he had learned to be a worshiper in good times. And beloved, we need to le learn to be worshipers of God now. Now. Before times get any tougher, we need to worship God now. So that when times get tougher, we learn to worship instead of complain. We learn to worship instead of murmur. And he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh yes, and what's going to happen to Job's children? Because Job prayed for them, and he asked God to forgive them of their sins. Job will see those dead children again in the resurrection. So Job is saying, look, God gave, God takes away, God is in control of everything. I'll see my children again. Because he knew that he was going to see God again. In my flesh shall I see God. He said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. He said all these things in the midst of this great controversy in order to demonstrate the character that had to come out in the midst of this. And beloved, there's going to be characters at this time during this virus, during these, the, these dark days ahead that we're looking at, during these solemn times, there are going to be Christians that are going to be produced in this time, that are going to be put in the furnace so we can be heated hotter, so we can reveal Christ to the people, so we can reveal His grace and his strength and his righteousness so he can see that there is a people who will serve the Lord no matter what. And we've got to have faith. We've got to have faith in these times, just like Job did. Job didn't understand what was going on. It hadn't been revealed to Job that Satan had demanded for his life, for the lives of his people, for, 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 for God to prove that he was still a man of God. He didn't know all this that was going on. But he stayed faithful to God. You may not know why this is happening. I may not know why this is happening. I don't have a direct revelation from God to tell you what's happening. But whether God did it directly or whether Satan has asked for it and God has allowed it, it's still happening under the permission of God. And it's happening for a reason. For those of you who need to turn and repent before God, this is your time to repent. For those of you who need to come to Christ and be forgiven of your sins and be saved in His kingdom, this is the time to do it. For those of you who need to reveal a character of sterling and of gold so the world can see what a Christian man, what a Christian woman looks like, what a Christian family looks like in times of difficulty, this is the time to stand up and be counted. And so that is why God is doing this and allowing this. For us to grow in maturity. 
Beloved, we need spiritual maturity in these dark days. We need a maturity that's not going to complain like everybody else in the world. We need a maturity that is not going to do what everybody else is doing, murmuring, complaining, and panicking. We need to come to a point where we're doing things right now to glorify God, whether by our death or by our life. Because, sure, coronavirus can kill any of us. Yeah, that's true. There's no guarantees, but so can crossing the street. <laughs> Anything can kill us. So we've put our pinpoint now on this virus, and, 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 and it, it, it amazes me how many people are you know, getting on planes or something like that, and they're putting on masks and, or going to grocery stores, and they're, they're putting on cellophane all over their bodies to protect themselves from this virus, not realizing that the plane can crash. Not realizing that when they step out of the grocery into the parking lot, they can get hit by a car. Not realizing that so many other things can happen. They can have a heart attack and drop dead. Now we're aware of the reality of death. Now we see the reality of death. And people are trying to protect themselves. And I'm not saying you need to stay three meters away. That makes you feel better. Stay three meters away. Cover yourself all over if you want to. But remember something. Your life and mine are in the hands of God. They're not in the hands of a virus. They're in the hand of God. And we live in a sinful world. And this world is full of death. And everything dies around us, not just from one virus, but from so many other things. So God is saying, look to me. Look to me right now. I am your life, he says. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Don't look to the things that are happening in the world. Don't look to the reactions of the world. Look to Christ. Fourthly, other times plagues are fulfillments of prophecy to show God's people that they must believe Him and live for Him before these things come to pass. We study prophecy, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people today saying, okay, coronavirus, this is where we are in the grand scheme of things, and it's going to go like this and like that and like that, and that's great, that's fine. <laughs> but if we're not ready, that means nothing. The chart, the scenario, they mean nothing right now. Because Jesus gave some, and he said it. He said, look, I'm telling you all these things so that when they come to pass, you'll know that I told you. And what should that produce in you? When you see that everything Jesus said was going to happen is happening. What should that produce in you? Faith. Trust. He said it. He knew these things were going to come to pass on this world. He knew exactly how it was going to happen. So let me believe in Him even more now. Let me have more faith in Him now. Let me trust Him more now instead of less. But you notice human nature? Oh, human nature is so terrible. It's so carnal. Because when these things come to pass, we trust Him less. And we don't look at the fact that these things are a revelation of the Word of God and of His knowledge. And so we ought to trust Him more. If He knew all this was going to happen, don't you think He made provision for this? Don't you think he made provision? I'm not saying not to make provision for your family. Buy food that you need. Absolutely. Feed your family. Have food that you can feed your family. Do the things that you need to do. But what I'm saying is, God is the provider. Learn that God is the provider. And learn that God is the one who makes provision, not only for your physical needs. <laughs> Man, if he can make, if he could make a little thing of flour and a little vase of oil last for two years during that drought, he can do anything. If he can multiply bread and fish, he can do anything. Yes, I'll do my part. I'll prepare myself as best as I can to provide for my family. But I need to depend on him for the increase. And God is saying not only for the physical provision, but here's the kick. He's also saying for the spiritual provision. I have provided for you, warning you these things are going to happen, so you can prepare your family, your children, yourself, your church, to meet God when He comes. That's the key. That's the provision He's made. Now notice here, Matthew 24. Right? We love to read these prophecies and tell everybody, okay, this is happening exactly like it says it's going to happen. Great. Praise God. He knew it. He said it. His word is true. 
Now what? How do we live? Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation shall rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, are there famines? Pestilences, yes, plagues, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. <laughs> Look what's coming next. Verse 9, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, I'm not doing eisegesis here. I know you theologians in the crowd say, well, this was during the Dark Ages, and that's it. Fine. But isn't this relevant for us today? That the next thing that can happen to us is that we will be delivered up, persecuted for our faith? Sure. Are we ready for that? That's the question I'm asking. He says that's the beginning of sorrows. So when God brings all these things to pass, He's preparing you for what's coming next. He's preparing you to stand for Him to the death. Because you see, after coronavirus, well, we're not going to fear death anymore. We're not going to fear anything anymore because we will have made our lives right with God. And even if they come to us, and even if they say, deny your faith, or we're going to take everything away from you, take it all away. My treasure is hid with Christ. You see, so look at how we look at these things and we don't realize what Jesus is saying. Look, all these things God is allowing to prepare His people, to prepare the world, that whether by our life or by our death, people will come to Christ and will stand for our faith. Where are you in this, beloved? Where am I? We need to examine ourselves. This is the time of self-examination. This is not the time to panic. This is not the time to go crazy to see if you have enough toilet paper in the stock. This is the time to get right with God. This is the time to make sure that you're right with God. This is the time to make sure that your heart is right with God. Look what he says in Luke 21, verses 11 to 19. He says, look, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places. Famines, pestilences, fearful sights, great signs shall be there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you, persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues and to prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Notice what he says in the next verse. But it shall turn to you for a testimony. Wow. So when they bring you into these things, it'll turn into a testimony. Can't we turn this corona thing into a testimony? <laughs> Can't we turn this thing into a powerful testimony that, Lord, whatever happens, I do my part to protect my family physically? Absolutely. I do my part to protect my family and have food in my, in my kitchen because if we don't provide, we're worse than an infidel. I do my part. But the greatest and most important part, I will not neglect either, which is the salvation of my children, the salvation of my family, the salvation of my heart. Turn it into a testimony. Let people see that as a Christian, this virus doesn't frighten you. Let them see that as a Christian, you're not afraid of what's going to happen. Let them see that as a Christian, you already knew this was going to happen. You already knew we were going to be in for the... Why is it that when, when, when we read prophecy and we say, oh, there's hard times coming, and people keep saying, there's hard times coming, and then they come and everybody acts like, what's going on? How can this happen? I was doing well. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. How, how, how could all... Wait a minute. <laughs> so what are we studying prophecy for? To entertain ourselves? To put all the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together so that we make sure we got the chart and it's all ready? Is that why we study prophecy? Or did Jesus give us prophecy so we could be ready for His second coming? Did Jesus give us prophecy to strengthen us so that we could be prepared for His soon coming? What are we studying prophecy for? That's the whole purpose of prophecy. Prophecy edifies. It builds up. It's supposed to build you spiritually. It's an amazing thing how, how we do these things. And notice how Christians will react. Christians react to these things how? It turns into a testimony. Verse 14, Settle it therefore in your hearts not to meditate before what ye shall answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gainsay or resist. And you shall be betrayed by both parents and brethren and kinsfolks, friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not an hair of your head perish. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. How could he say there's not a hair of your head that's going to perish or they're going to put us to death? Because that's not the life we're protecting. This life is not important. It's the next life that is vital. And look what he says. 
In your patience, possess ye your souls. What is the patience of the saints? What is it? Come on, you know the answer. Here are they that do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Do you keep the commandments of God by the righteousness and the power of Christ in you? Do you have the faith of Jesus Christ in you? Then in patience possess ye your souls. If you don't, make it right with God and He will give you the power to obey Him. So yes, in 26 he says, Men's hearts will be failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming to the earth for the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Men's hearts will be failing them for fear. Not my people's hearts. Not my church. Not my people, my movement, my remnant. They're not going to be failing for fear. Men are going to be failing for fear. And that's what's happening. Shouldn't we display the peace of Christ, the bravery of Christ, the faith of Christ. Because look, look at how the ungodly are going to react to plagues. Look at Revelation 16. Man, we love looking at these passages, but how different they become when we're actually going through them, isn't it? It's nice to look at things theoretically, isn't it? When, when nothing is happening, it's nice to look at things and go, yeah, that means that, this means this, and yeah, there's going to be persecution, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah, but I love Jesus and He loves me. Yeah? How about now? How about now? Look at when it's actually happening, how the meaning of the scriptures change, how deep and profound they become, how real they are now. They're not a theory anymore. Look at what it says in verse 8 of Revelation 16. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. That's the fourth plague. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give Him glory. See, these people know it's God. He, they know it's God's judgment. And they don't repent. They actually blaspheme Him. Shouldn't we be so careful? Those people, their probation has closed already. They, they're not coming to repentance anymore. And they're under the seven last plagues, which is still future. So this is nothing. I want to be ready, don't you? I don't want to be blaspheming God now, because if I blaspheme Him now, I'll blaspheme Him then. If I, if I don't repent now, if I don't give Him glory now, I won't give Him glory then. I'll be among that number. And notice verse 10, The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because their, of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Did you catch the difference? <laughs> they had pain and soreness. They blasphemed them because of that, but they didn't repent of their deeds. You see, God is saying, look, don't be complaining about the hard times physically. Don't be complaining about what's happening now physically because you're in pain or soreness or travail. Look at your deeds. What are your deeds? What are you doing for God? If you don't, then if we live that long, we'll be among that number who blasphemes God. Did you see the difference between the two reactions? Plagues and fulfillments are, are fulfillments of prophecy at other times to show God's people that they must believe in Him, live for Him before these things come to pass. So, beloved, maybe we didn't get ourselves ready for this one. Can we get ready now? Can we start getting ready right now? This is our opportunity. What can we learn for self-examination through COVID-19 spiritually? Well, First of all, sin is more lethal than COVID-19. More lethal than any disease out there. I don't care how lethal they say the disease is. Sin is worse. Interestingly, with COVID-19, you can have it and not know it. <laughs> and so many people do not examine their hearts to see if there's any wicked way within them. And you can spread it to others unknowingly. And so often we influence others to evil. Because we don't examine our own hearts. Think about these things below. Look at things spiritually, and then you will be able to see the reality of these things. <laughs> People are buying up stores. Now, I'm not saying you want to pack up. So we've all become panic buyers because of the first panic buyers. So now we're all panic buying because we're afraid we're going to run out of something. Because they're running out of everything. So now we're buying and we're hoarding everything. 
And God says, what shall it profit if you gain the whole supermarket and lose your own soul? What shall it profit? You're going to feed your family for a couple of months, three months, six months, a year. You have storage enough capacity to feed them for a year. Fine. Then what? When life comes to an end, maybe this thing will pass and everything will go back to normal. <laughs> then what? What happens in eternity? So I want to close by giving us some solutions, biblical solutions. How must we respond to this plague? How must we respond to this crisis and any other for that matter? Any other for that matter? Well, first of all, I want to show you what it says in Numbers chapter 16, 46 to 50. Numbers chapter 16, 46 to 50. Moses, uh, this was a plague that had hit because the people murmured against Moses and the congregation and accusing them of killing <laughs> the rebels, right? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And now they were accusing Moses of doing it. The glory of the Lord appeared in verse 42. And the Lord spake unto Moses, verse 44, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer, put fire therein from off the altar, put on the incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there's wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun upon the people, among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people. What does incense stand for? Prayer. Incense is the prayers of the saints. Took that incense, went to the altar, offered it for the people. And he stood, it says, verse 48, between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. 14,000 people died in that plague. It was a pretty serious plague. But what stopped it? The intercession of Aaron. This is the time when God's church should be praying. This is the time where wherever you are, in your home, wherever you are, you should be on your knees, agonizing before God to put an end to this. Beseeching God to stop the plague. Beseeching God to give us a little more time to win the world. Beseeching God to allow people to live so that they can find Christ before it's too late. This is the time when we ought to be praying like never before. And this is the time God had to bring us through to this time to realize how much we ought to be praying. How much we ought to be praying. Numbers 21, 8 to 10. And the Lord said unto Moses, after another plague now, the Lord, uh, the, the people murmured again. They were discouraged because of the way. In verse 4. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread, there's no water. Our soul loatheth this light bread. They were loathing the manna which was God's provision for them. And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. You notice, there's no why here. There's no why question. We've sinned. That's the reaction God is looking for. For we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, and then what did the Lord tell him to do? Put the bronze serpent on the pole. And what happened? And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten when he looketh upon it shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. What was the key? Look. Look. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, as they lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up, 
That serpent was a type of Christ. Why is a serpent? Because Jesus on the cross became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. But what's the key here? The key is, in this time, look to Christ. Look to Christ by faith. Look to Him. This is the time to look upon Him. This is the time to look upon Him who bled on Calvary's cross for you. This is the time to gaze upon Him. This is the time to look upon Him so that He can minister His forgiveness, His grace, His love toward you, His peace. Look to Christ in total faith. This is the time to do it. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Beginning in verse 1. And there were present at that season some that told them of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Now, this is an interesting thing. The Galileans were enemies, and so Pilate went to the Galileans, and he basically killed them while they were making sacrifices. He mingled their blood with the blood of their sacrifice. A terrible, a terrible, heinous, hateful act. But what did Jesus answer? What did he say when they came and told him this? And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What did he mean by that? First of all, he meant that just because you're suffering something doesn't mean you've committed the sin to be suffering. It's your fault. Not necessarily. Job did nothing to suffer for what he was suffering for. But Job's character was produced. There are times when you suffer because of the things you have done. And you're suffering directly because of the consequences of your bad decisions, of your sinful nature, of your things that you've done. You suffer judgment because of it. But not all the time. And Jesus is opening the question. Jesus doesn't say, oh, I'm so sorry. How could God do, allow such a thing to happen to the Galileans? Or why did he do this? What did he say? He said, do you suppose that they were greater sinners? Because the idea at that time was, well, they must have been some pretty bad sinners, those Galileans, to get that kind of fate. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 we live in a sinful world. If you don't repent of your sins, you will likewise perish. What does that mean? Pilate will come and kill you too? No, that means it'll be sudden. It'll be brutal just like that. If you don't repent. And then he says, in, or those 18... Verse 4, upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In other words, we're all sinners. <laughs> and we all deserve. That tower, and he even gave them another news item. That tower fell on them? Do you think because they were greater sinners? No, but unless you repent you're also going to have something sudden happen and you won't have a chance. This message has gone out to the world. It's going out to the world. And God is giving opportunity for people to repent. And then he gives the parable of the fig tree. It wasn't producing figs. So the gardener came and he says, the dresser, these three years the owner came and I have I've been seeking fruit on this tree and find none, cut it down. Why cumbereth at the ground? He answered and said to him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that you shall cut it down. God gives opportunities of mercy for us to get our act together. This is one of those times. We need to make sure that we are right with God. This is your opportunity to get right with God. It may be your last. Don't take it lightly. Take it seriously. Take it seriously. Trust in God. Trust in God. Notice what it says in Psalm 112. Psalm 112. Psalm 112, I want to look at 7 and 8. Talking about a godly man. He shall not be afraid of what? Evil tidings. Bad news. He will not be afraid of bad news. Why will he not be afraid of bad news? 
Three reasons. Number one, verse one. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Fear the Lord is to respect Him, to revere Him, to tremble before Him, to know that He's God, He has made us and not we ourselves. And to delight greatly in His commandments means that whatever He tells us to do, we do it with delight. It's not a burden. That's number one. This is the man who, when he hears evil tidings, he's not moved. His heart, why else? He's not afraid. Secondly, verse 7, He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Why? Because his heart is fixed. Fixed on what? Rooted and grounded in Christ. Fixed on God. Immovable. Established, like it says in verse 8. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. It's established. Thirdly, trusting in the Lord. He fears God. He delights greatly in his commandments. His heart is established. He's, his heart is fixed. And he trusts in God. It's interesting to me that the one thing that they're telling people to do right now, more than anything else, is to wash their hands. And where does that come from? The Bible. The Bible tells us to wash in running water. In Leviticus 15, 13, when somebody had touched something unclean or something, you know, they were to wash in running water. You know that it took a doctor to realize that even in 1845 because people hadn't even realized it then. We think we're so ahead with our technology. And it right comes down to something the Bible's already said. Just wash your hands. Keep yourself clean. Isn't that interesting that the Bible once again comes into focus here? Not only as the physical solution, but as the spiritual solution. I just find that fascinating. And so Psalm 91, which many people have been quoting, and it's worthy of quotation. What does it say? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. The pestilence, the plague that walketh in the darkness that nobody can tell where it's coming from and where it's going. You're not going to be afraid of it. A thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold to see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. Therefore shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Why? Because he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Now, is the Bible mocking at us by saying it won't come near your dwelling? Is that the only thing we're going to zero in on? Or is God saying, look, when you live for me, you're not going to be afraid of what's going to happen. You, can, you will be protected Till your work is done. I love what George Whitfield said a long time ago. You are immortal till your work is done. Isn't that wonderful? I'm not talking about the immortality of the soul, so don't get the Adventist antennas up too fast. In other words, you're protected in this world, in this life, until your work is done when you stick close to the Lord. God has a work for you to do right now. God has a message for you to give right now. God has a witness and a testimony for you to give right now. And until, I'm talking about God's people now, and until you do that work that He's given you to do, you don't have to fear any plague coming nigh thy dwelling. Yeah, eventually we're going to die in this world. Eventually death comes, whether by old age or accident or anything else, it comes. But we're immortal till our work is done. And then we can claim these promises and say, look, I'm not afraid. Whatever happens, I want to be in the hands of God. But if you're not in the hands of God today, you're in the hands of the devil. And the devil doesn't play around. And the devil doesn't care if you have a work to do or not. And the devil doesn't care if you live or not. He'd rather you die, actually. 
The devil wants to rob, kill, and steal, and destroy. That's what he is. So you need to think about the fact today, or am I in the hands of God? Am I dwelling in the secret place of the Most High and abiding under the shadow of the Almighty? Am I saying the Lord, of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust? No matter what, I trust Him. I love Him. I want to serve Him. You know that that is all that matters, that we get ready to meet Christ. And now it's more real to the people of God than it's ever been before, isn't it? Because of this. Because of this, it's more real now. Now we're, now we're really looking up and saying, wow, this is all that matters. And if, if, if this thing has produced that reaction, then God has gotten what He wanted to produce in you. If this thing has produced the reaction of, I can only trust God now. I can only depend on God now. I can only live for God now. I only want to be ready for Christ to come now. Glory, hallelujah. He's brought you to the place that you need to be. That's the place He wants you to be all the time. Whether it's good or whether it's bad. But sometimes He's got to allow the bad to come in to get us to that point to say, I just want to live for Him now. I just want to be in heaven when Christ comes. Don't you want to be in heaven when Christ comes, beloved? And to you that's listening to me or will listen to me in the future by God's grace, and you are not right with God, make your life right with God now. Now's the time. Look, the world can't help you. Nothing else can help you. Only God can help you. Too many stories, and I close. One is about the Moravian missionaries. I love telling this story because it always touches my heart. The Moravians were such powerful missionaries because of their 100-year prayer chain that they did, which went intergenerationally, by the way. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, people were assigned to pray every hour on the hour. Wouldn't that be a good idea if we did that? And after that prayer, a great revival came. And these missionaries were so powerful and so fearless and so focused on the mission of giving Christ to everyone that they met that they went to this place where there was a very famous leper colony. And two of them decided they were going to go in there, sacrifice their lives to witness to these lepers. They went in, they witnessed to them, and they died of leprosy. But it doesn't end there. Two others were waiting outside to take their place. Moravians. And every time they would get a notice from the leprosy colony that the two missionaries had died, two more would go in and continue witnessing intergenerationally. Isn't that interesting? I mean, that blows my mind. See, these men weren't going in there and saying, look, I'm going to live through all this. I'm going to make it through the leper colony. They didn't care about that. They said, look, as long as I'm here and I stay alive, I'm going to witness to the Lord. Isn't that a good attitude to have? Don't God's people need that attitude today? Look, as long as I'm here, as long as I've got breath in me, I'm going to keep giving the gospel. And then you have a story like John G. Lake, who went to South Africa, and there was a great, I believe it was a scarlet fever that was going on over there. And he prayed to God to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that he would be immune to this fever that everybody else was catching. So that he could minister the gospel to those people. And you know what happened to him? He went to South Africa. And he was helping people bury their dead. And, and preaching Christ to them. Touching dead bodies. Breathing in dead fumes. And nothing happened to him. He never got sick. He was immune to the disease. Why? Because God would have it so. God gave him that prayer to pray. So that he could be protected. It's not up to us. It's up to God. It's not up to us to be asking questions. It's up to us simply to have the attitude, Lord, thy will be done in my life. I will do whatever thou commandest me to do. I will go wherever thou commandest me to go. And I will go through whatever thou commandest me to go through. That's why missionaries have gone to other lands. They've lost uh, wives. They've lost children. They've lost husbands. They've lost people. And they've continued to minister to them. Why? Because that was the goal. That was the goal. And there are others who have gone and been missionaries for 80 years in the same place and they died comfortably in their bed of old age and they never got any of the sicknesses that were going around back then. Why? Because it's all up to God. God has the plan. And you know what? 
God has a plan even right now through coronavirus. He has a plan. He's already figured it out. A long time ago, he figured it out. So what have we to fear? Let's rest in his hands. Let's come to him. Let's depend upon him. Let's have the attitude of, Lord, whatever thou wouldst have me do, just give me the strength and the faith to do it. Wherever thou wouldst have me go, Lord, just give me the strength to do it. I will live for thee. I will be faithful to thee. I just want to be in thy will. And I know that no matter what happens, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. Because God has it in his hands. He's got it in his hands. Do you understand now how we ought to see these things? I'm so glad because I did this study for myself. <laughs> I saw all this happening and I said, Lord, how do we respond to these things biblically? I don't want to respond the way somebody else is telling me to respond. I don't want to respond the way somebody else feels or another person's emotions or guidelines and suggestions. I want to respond the way the Bible tells me to respond. So Lord, teach me, how do I look at this? And he showed it to me. It's all by his glory. I have nothing to do with it. He just downloaded this down in my mind and showed it to me. And it gave me such courage and faith to be able to walk with God and to, to bring it, to distill it to that essence of, I just want to be thine. I just want to live for thee. Slay self in me and let Christ live in me. Do you want to say that today? Whether you're hearing me and you're a Christian, you want to give your life to God right now, or whether you're not, you're not a Christian, and you're hearing these words and you see that the Bible is very relevant to coronavirus. It'll always be relevant to anything that comes in this world. The Bible will always be relevant. It will always be up to date. It will never run out of updateness. It's beyond the newspaper. It's beyond the future. It's an eternal book. So will you say with me today, Lord, I want to give my life to thee fully. Whether you're a Christian or not, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to repent of my sins so that I know that no matter what happens, I'm ready to meet God. I'm ready to have eternal life. And I'm not going to worry anymore. I'm going to do my best to serve God with His power because He's got everything in His hands. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Would you like to say that? If you do, well, let's kneel together. Oh, Lord our God. Father, I'm so thankful for these scriptures that have shown me a lot in my life that I have to examine so that I can be right with Thee, O oh Lord. I can be ready for Thy soon coming. And I'm so thankful for these scriptures, and I just pray, Lord, that the people who have heard or will hear of these things, that their minds will be tuned heavenwards, that we will realize, O oh God, that these things have come upon us because we need to repent of our sins. We need to make things right with Thee. And so, Father, I begin with myself, and I ask for everyone out there that Thou please make our hearts right with Thee. We confess our sins before Thee, Lord. We are sinners. We have sinned. We have done unrighteously. We have not kept our minds on the goal, on the mission that Thou has given to us. We have not kept our minds on Christ. And today we want to repent of these things. We want a new heart. Create in us a clean heart, a new heart, O God, and renew in us a right spirit. Fill us with thy Holy Spirit, dear God, that we might be able to witness for thee to the world. Give us the task at hand and help us to commit it with all our might through Christ and his power. And oh, Father, for those who are watching who are not Christians, Lord, show them that our only hope is Christ. But he's not only our only hope, he's our greatest hope. He's the hope that we want. He's the hope of the world. He's the desire of ages. He's the lily of the valley. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the first and the last, the author and the finisher of the faith, the lamb, the savior of the world, the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Bring them, bring them to him that he might save them, that he might forgive them, that he might cleanse them and fill them with his spirit. 
so that they can know, O Lord, what they ought to do. O God, show us what we ought to do. Show us, dear God. Revive thy people. Strengthen thy people during this time. Take away the fear and the anxiety. Take away the faithlessness. Take away the, 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 the regrets, but help us to bring our sins to thee. This is no time to wallow in our guilt, O God. And if we're, if, we're, if we're entertaining guilt that leads to death, the repentance that leads to death, help us to entertain it no more. But help us to entertain the repentance that leads to salvation, to confession, to forgiveness, to, to be cleansed of sin and forgiven of all unrighteousness, to have the peace of God that passeth all understanding, and to decide from this day forward, not like Pharaoh did, not with the purpose of hardening the heart later on. From this point forward, we are thine, and thou art ours. We thank thee and we praise thee for all these things, asking them in the matchless, holy, fragrant, and strong name of Jesus Christ, our shepherd. Amen. <laughs>